Good morning, everyone, on this bright and very cold morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm director of the Europe program here at CSIS, and we are absolutely privileged and delighted to welcome a colleague and a friend, uh, Estonian Minister of Defense, Yuri Luik, here with us this morning. Um, there is so much to talk about. We are four months away from a very important NATO summit. We uh, received a very um, vibrant visual display last week from President Putin uh, on uh, potentially new weapon systems that Russia is developing, which puts a very sharp focus uh, on uh, Europe's uh, security environment. And of course, we continue to look towards uh, Europe and how it's evolving its defense spending as well as its defense capabilities. Uh, and there is no one better to help us frame that conversation than Minister Yuri Luik. Looking at Minister Luik's resume is a humbling experience. And one, one just sees uh, oneself as an underachiever. This is, uh, this is Minister Luik's third stint as Minister of Defense. He has served as Foreign Minister. He has served as Estonia's ambassador to Moscow, to Washington, to NATO. He has led Estonia's most prestigious think tank. It goes on and on. He has really, uh, so there's no one better to get an insight of not only what is going on uh, in the European security environment, but insights, uh, particularly on Russia. So let me get out of the way and welcome Minister Luik to the podium and then get into a great discussion with your applause please join me in welcoming Minister Yuri Luik. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather, very much for this uh, extremely kind uh, introduction. Uh, happy to welcome everybody on my behalf. And I'll try to be rather short. That's what people always say when they try to be rather short uh, because I see so many uh, faces in the audience of whom I know uh, uh, that they will be asking uh, very pointed and serious questions. Uh, but let me just start uh, by saying that uh, ahead of the 2018 NATO summit, it's the right time to take a moment and evaluate uh, the results of the Wales uh, 2014 and Warsaw 2016 summits in terms of what has been implemented and what still remains to be done. Uh, there are different ways to evaluate NATO's current posture. Uh, if we compare the size of our forces, their readiness uh, to the Cold War period, we are obviously a much changed alliance than we were decades and decades ago. However, if we compare the situation with the alliance four years ago, at the start of the Russian aggression to Ukraine, we see a lot of progress. Since 2014, the alliance has renewed its focus on collective defense. A mental change has taken place among the allies and defense spending is on the rise. You know, when I I came to work at NATO in 2000, uh, what was it, 2007? Uh, then uh, it was forbidden to discuss Russia among allies, literally forbidden. The only discussion about Russia was supposed to happen in the NATO-Russia Council, and everything else was considered offensive. Uh, for me, it was a total shocker, of course. <laughs> I thought, uh, uh, NATO should, should discuss Russia already then, because we saw what happened in 2007 uh, and, uh, of course, 2008. Uh, in Estonia, we have a political consensus that funding for national defense is a priority. In 2017, we spent 2.15 percent of our GDP on defense. It enables us to develop our own initial self-defense capability and also to build up host nation support for allies in Estonia. 
We are doing our part in building our capabilities to resist armed attack, but as a small nation, we will remain dependent on NATO's collective defense under the United States leadership. Uh, I, I, I have to note that uh, the United States not only provides uh, deterrence under the NATO umbrella, but now in the framework of uh, European uh, deterrence initiative, we are also getting considerable funds compared to our own, sort of in comparison to our own defense budget, uh, from the US government to build up our own self-defense capabilities, particularly when it comes to smart ammunition uh, which is something uh, which the U.S. possesses, but which, looking from our point of view, is, is an extremely expensive investment. So we, I, I met with Secretary Mattis yesterday and uh, uh, em emphasized my, my gratitude for, for, that kind of, uh, for that kind of commitment. We are very grateful for the steadfast U.S. commitment to the European security the increase of American military presence in Europe and the growth of the, the aforementioned European Deterrence Initiative funding are crucial for ensuring stable and secure Europe. On NATO's eastern flank, we now have allied boots on the ground with the multinational NATO battle groups or the enhanced forward presence, EFP, in Baltics and Poland. Uh, they send a clear message of allied unity and resolve and thereby reduce the risk of miscalculation by our opponent. Uh, I don't think there is a deeper sign of solidarity among nations than to send your boys and girls uh, to protect another country, sort of being visibly present. Uh, the British battalion which we have in Estonia with usually either Danish or French company added is 150 kilometers, even less, from the Russian border. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty strong signal uh, from, from the alliance. But we are not talking only about deterrence. For us, it's also very important that the troops which come to Estonia, that the time they spend in Estonia would also be valuable for them. Uh, so the British, Danish, and French troops training together with their Estonian counterparts, give them a unique chance to work on increasing interoperability. The lessons they learn together in the, what the French call the cold jungle, which is our forest, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> actually benefit the entire alliance. Uh, and this is an important part because, you know, people come to Estonia who have never properly even walked in a forest. And uh, uh, it's, it's quite complicated. The French sent their foreign legion, uh, foreign legion units, which obviously came right from, from the African operations. So, so for them, this is quite an experience. NATO actually has, quote unquote, proper forests uh, when it comes to training grounds, only, uh, really only in Canada and probably the United States. Uh, but uh, in, in, in Western Europe, there are no proper forests anymore, uh, quite literally, including in the UK, where most of the troops uh, come from. Uh, so the implementation of the enhanced forward presence has been a true success story, but the work of making it as effective as possible is not yet completed. We need to keep working to ensure coherence of all battle groups and on joint enablement, enablement of the EFP. Uh, and this is an important part because we have the Allied Battalion, they are in the Estonian Brigade. Uh, Warsaw Summit says that they are there for, well, basically symbolic presence, but also as a trigger. So there is always a question, if there is a trigger, and it is triggered, what will happen then? Uh, the, the, the old tripwire question, so to say. Uh, and uh, that's why we very much hope that the new NATO summit in July will focus on issues of reinforcement, follow-on forces, 
uh, deployments, uh, speed of deployments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these will be, uh, um, I mean, we can say reinforcement in a in a in a broad sense uh, will be the key uh, deliverable from our point of view would be a key deliverable from our point of view from the July summit. Uh, we can then ensure both the credibility of the trigger function of the enhanced forward presence and the effectiveness of the alliance defense posture as a whole. Speed is the key here, but also the numbers. Without having sufficient numbers of forces that are ready to rapidly react in case of crisis, our deterrence and defense posture will not suffice. In addition, considering that the past decades of the alliance has lost a lot of know-how on how to rapidly move forces, we should actually exercise moving large amounts of troops and equipment. Our priority should be to ensure the most rapid deployment of forces in case of crisis. You know that those who remember the Cold War, you remember the uh, reinforcement exercises which were part and parcel of the defense posture uh, of, of that era. And of course, we completely finished that practice after the fall of the uh, Cold War, after the end of the Cold War, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and uh, we are very much emphasizing that this practice of major uh, deployment reinforcement exercises uh, should be uh, sort of recreated. Of course, one has to take into consideration the modern circumstances. I mean. You cannot necessarily replicate the size, the amount, et cetera, et cetera, of the Cold War, and it's not necessary. But uh, large redeployment exercises, reinforcement exercises, we believe are an important, uh, uh, important aspect of that discussion. Uh, that is why we would also support committing to military mobility pledge at the summit to have allies shorten their diplomatic clearance procedures by pledging to provide a permission for border crossings by allied forces within, for instance, five days. This is something we have already done in the Baltics with our simplified allied movement pledge. This is one of the projects where NATO and European Union work together because European Union has actually proposed this project uh, which is in shorthand called the military Schengen, uh, which would seriously shorten the uh, diplomatic clearance of, uh, for the units, uh, so that especially in training situation, but also in crisis situation, the, the bureaucratic backlog wouldn't uh, slow down the movement of troops. Uh, this has been tried several times, and you would be surprised how complicated it is for allied troops uh, our friends and supporters to cross the uh, borders of uh, separate allied nations. Uh, so that is something which uh, we should uh, certainly uh, address. Our success will ultimately also depend upon adequate command and control and our political will to act. The alliance has started to adapt the new NATO command structure for its to be fit for purpose, including for the most demanding collective defense tasks. We welcome the US decision to take the lead uh, with the new Joint Forces Command that will help strengthen also our maritime posture in the North Atlantic. We are also taking steps to speed up and improve decision making. Uh, this requires improving both our national and NATO procedures but also communicating to our public that if needed, the alliance will act as one. Just one example, and those who have worked in NATO remember it well, uh, when NATO runs its big crisis management exercises every year, the crisis exercise, Estonia uses these exercises also to, uh, to hone, to polish its own crisis response procedures. So in our case, if our ambassador in NATO says something, this has been confirmed in real time by the actual Estonian government. Because in many cases, the government, quote unquote, is played by a desk officer. 
in, uh, in, in, many, in many countries. Uh, they don't take the, the national versus international uh, kind of uh, interface uh, seriously. Many countries don't take it seriously at all. And in times of real crisis, uh, this will be an impediment to quick uh, decision making. Finally, let me say a couple of words about uh, the EU defense dimension. Uh, there's no doubt that there is a political momentum in defense cooperation in the European Union framework. During Estonia's recent EU presidency, defense matters became more central and new initiatives such as permanent structured cooperation, the so-called PESCO, and the European Defense Fund were launched. I would like to stress here that we would never have worked with these initiatives if we would have believed in any shape or form that they would undermine NATO. It is crystal clear that NATO will remain bedrock of European security architecture and crucial in ensuring effective deterrence in Europe. European Union will not replace it, nor does it have any capabilities nor intention to do so. Uh, I think it's important here to keep in mind that while NATO's main purpose is defense, EU's, EU was not built for defense purposes, on the contrary. So even as we speak about any defense arrangements, 95% of EU deals with economic issues, environmental issues, uh, I don't know, foreign trade standards, etc., etc. So defense and foreign policy will always remain one fraction of European Union's activities. So even structurally, it's impossible to imagine that one would take the place of the other, that NATO would take, uh, that EU would take the place of NATO, or vice versa. Uh, so I think we are on, on pretty steady ground here. Uh, we shouldn't leave European Union to remain passively observing European defense efforts. Instead of developing defense cooperation within European Union, we can use the strength of the EU to strengthen the European pillar of NATO. These strengths are, for example, in the areas where civilian and military issues meld together as I already mentioned, the uh, project on military mobility is the best example of that. Um, military mobility is, I would believe, a prime area of deepening NATO-EU cooperation, but there are other important areas where EU and NATO cooperation would be very useful. For instance, cyber security, joint <laughs> crisis management exercises, Cyber, of course, is an era, area which doesn't recognize neither the international borders nor the borders of any international organizations. Uh, and cyber is probably the key issue where the civilian use of that domain and military use of the domain uh, seamlessly kind of bend together. Uh, so it is only logical that uh, cyber, almost by definition, could be an excellent uh, tool or an excellent era, area for uh, NATO-EU cooperation. Also, quite honestly, there is a benefit that cyber is, a, is kind of a new frontier. It's a new domain. So some of the deeply seated uh, uh, animosities which we face in EU-NATO cooperation on quote-unquote older projects uh, do not or, or are perhaps easier to, to be overcome uh, easier to uh, overcome in uh, terms of uh, cyber. I am confident that we can use both formats, NATO and EU, to motivate countries to do more. By this, we can contribute to collective defense and increase European and transatlantic security. And as you <coughs> noticed, I didn't mention Russia even once. <laughs> So uh, I, when somebody brings it up in, in the question and answer session, I'd be happy to, to comment if, if you are interested in So this concludes my initial presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Minister Week, thank you so much. I think uh, for those that were tweeting part of your uh, remarks, I would say hashtag cold jungle is going to be uh, trending here uh, today, but uh, thank you so much. Um, I was also struck by your comments uh, when you were Estonia's uh, permanent representative to NATO uh, in the 2007 era that you could not talk about Russia. 2007, of course, was the Bronze Night incident in Estonia where, where there was a massive cyber attack uh, and disruption. In some ways, we saw a little preview of new generation warfare uh, in Estonia in 2007. It's striking that that conversation could not have happened then. So thank you for bringing that, that history to us a little bit. I've got so many questions and I wanna jump right in and then I'm really excited to bring our audience into the conversation as well. I'm gonna start with the, the NATO summit a little bit. Um, I have to say I've, I've struggled to get my arms around exactly where the summit agenda will, will be in July. I've heard Secretary General Stoltenberg talk a lot about counterterrorism operations and Iraq training mission. Uh, I've heard a lot, obviously, on defense spending, and, and uh, Estonia is a leading example of that 2% uh, commitment uh, for defense spending. Is there some tension in the NATO conversation right now about the summit, about making sure the enhanced forward presence and all those uh, issues are top of mind versus the counterterrorism, what I would call a southern strategy mm. that NATO has been grappling with, but many NATO members are extremely concerned about instability and volatility to the south. I would welcome your comments on that, that NATO agenda uh, and what it, what it looks like. Oh, I, I don't think there is, a, there is any particular uh, sort of uh, clash between those two trends. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the Eastern European allies are very keen in uh, putting forward the point that they see the Allied security uh, uh, as uh, 360 degrees around the Allied perimeter. Uh, and uh, it would be very important for us to show uh, that we are also part of the Southern strategy that we can deliver also on uh, the solving the concerns of our southern allies. Uh, and then, of course, the southern allies uh, are clearly very forthcoming in participating uh, in the uh, quote-unquote Eastern project. Uh, I must say that uh, southern European allies are very active at the moment on the um, sort of Eastern frontline states. Uh, for instance, Italians are now um, running uh, the mm, air policing operations in Estonia. Uh, there are Portuguese units in the, is it Latvian EFP? In the Latvian EFP units. Uh, uh, Spaniards uh, have been in air policing many times. So they are taking it very seriously. And obviously it is only logical that we are taking uh, the southern aspect, the southern dimension, very seriously. The, the problem with the south is that uh, in the east, we are sort of replicating Cold War light, if you will. Uh, but in the south, the risks and challenges are so multifaceted that there is an almost a conceptual question. How can you address them? what would be your southern strategy, especially when it comes to NATO as a political military alliance? What can I do? What can we provide? And uh, I don't think we yet have a very good uh, handle uh, on that um, kind of comprehensive southern approach. Of course, we have a number of operations which we run. Uh, I mean, there are operations uh, when it comes to the Middle East uh, and the uh, Iraq training program, which you mentioned, will, will be one of the deliverables of the, of the NATO summit in July. We have decided it many times over already, but I think the alliance will sort of seal, the, the summit will seal the deal. Uh, but uh, the, the question of what else can we do 
is, I think, still in the air. We are certainly ready to be as active as possible. Estonia is also going to Africa. We will uh, er, be joining the French Operation Barkhan in Mali. Uh, and uh, so we use the opportunities which we have to participate in addressing various problems in the South, like uh, counterterrorism operations, uh, uh, etc. Et Your comment about uh, the Italians uh, leading the Estonian uh, NATO air policing mission uh, reminds me, we released several weeks ago a new report entitled Enhanced Deterrence in the North, where we felt that NATO had done a very good and effective job on the land component with the four NATO battalions. More work to be done, as you uh, very articulately noted in your comments, but that the air and maritime picture was lacking. And really, we drilled down a little bit in thinking that is air policing enough? Does this need to go into an air defense posture and getting those rules of engagement in case uh, we've had Russian incursions into NATO airspace uh, in Northern Europe? Europe, as well as the European Union, Sweden and Finland. Um, but what are your thoughts on think, having the alliance think more clearly about a, an, an air a defense posture? And then the second part of that question is clearly the nexus between NATO and EU is right in the Baltic Sea with Sweden and Finland. Mm -hmm. Um, how can they, what kind of role can Sweden and Finland play in enhancing Northern Europe's deterrent effect? Yeah, two very good questions. Let's start with air defense. Of course, during the Cold War, uh, and also according to the present policy, air policing, which we run at the moment, is essentially a civilian mission. It's not a combat mission. So it's basically to register the possible threats, to identify them, but not really to deploy any air defense assets as such. Uh, we believe that air defense is obviously something which is lacking at the moment. Uh, while we have, as you say, we have land covered, we have air policing to register threats, but if there would be a crisis situation, uh, we don't have uh, a relevant capability uh, or consequently we don't have a deterrent uh, against uh, air operations. So this is an issue which is being discussed. Uh, the fact is that air defense assets uh, which would have any practical value, because we do have uh, uh, short-range uh, air defense, the manpads, uh, but uh, going further than that, uh, these are financially extremely costly, and uh, the only way to solve this issue is by using uh, allied support um, equally or comparatively to comparing it to the air policing, for instance, where also allies accept that if we would start buying fighter planes, we would invest all our defense spending to fighter planes. The same goes for air defense. I mean, to have an effective air defense against Russia. We are not talking about the minor um, problem here. We are talking about Russia. Uh, you would need serious investment, uh, but not only investment, but you would need a comprehensive approach uh, into what, uh, uh, what is um, sort of necessary and, uh, and needed. When it comes to Finland and Sweden and NATO-EU relationship, you are of course right that the two uh, to uh, dimension uh, come together in the, in the Baltic region. I must say that uh, the defense cooperation between uh, Estonia and Finland and Estonia and Sweden is uh, very active. It's, uh, it's long term already from the start of the <coughs> restoration of Estonian independence. Uh, it's, it's, it would be difficult for me to count all these different facets of uh, interaction we have with uh, Finns and Swedes. Um, obviously, there is a Finnish and Swedish sovereign decision that they have no immediate plans to join NATO. 
Uh, there is a difference between the Finnish approach and the Swedish approach, but the fact is that uh, neither of them are ready to join as we speak. Uh, so I think it is only relevant to think of uh, other options, and you have discussed them in your very good report, in trying to keep them as close to us uh, as possible. Because if you look at the map, it's evident that, for instance, when it comes to protecting the Baltic states, uh, Finland and Sweden would play a very important, a very crucial role. Uh, we also have to understand, of course, that uh, it would be quite important that uh, the Finnish and Swedish uh, leadership would, would voice their interest in how they want to be plugged into NATO cooperation. Uh, and uh, this is also, I think, internally an ongoing discussion in, in Finland and Sweden. Uh, in Finland, I must say that uh, uh, they are our great friends, but we are sometimes surprised by the by the heated discussions inside the Finnish politics, whether they will come to the assistance of uh, Estonia when something would happen to Estonia. Uh, this was even one subject uh, during the Finnish presidential debates. Uh, and, uh, well, the issue was left open, obviously, but, uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting that they use this uh, uh, theme uh, for political discussions. But, but I don't think it's about Estonia. It's about the issue of uh, Finnish role in NATO. I mean, what should be their uh, position vis-a-vis -vis NATO, which in Finland is a complicated political question. Indeed. All right, it's time to turn to Russia. Uh, you offered, so I'll take you up on, on your offer. Um, we are heading towards a, a presidential election on March the 18th. Um, we have seen these uh, very dramatic news reports coming out of the United Kingdom. And, and it struck me that, in fact, because the British are the leading framework nation for the Estonian uh, NATO battalion, uh, there could be a, a dramatic deterioration in British-Russian relations uh, over this inc incident. I welcome your thoughts on that. And what did you make of President Putin's uh, speech last week and the announcement of several uh, uh, potentially very uh, destabilizing nuclear weapons that uh, he suggests Russia has uh, developed? Just would welcome your thoughts on that whole suite of issues. and. Just putting another one, thinking uh, what, what your thoughts were on the Zapad 2017 exercise. I, I, one of the best insights I received on Zapad 2013 was from Estonian uh, uh, experts and officials. And so I'd love, welcome your thoughts on what we saw last fall. Uh, it is obvious that the Western-Russian relations are in a very complicated phase. And of course, different countries have uh, different concerns when it comes to Russia. But when you go around in Western capitals, I think it's fair to say that the general nature of conversation is quite similar. I mean, perhaps different nations have different degrees of concerns, but the understanding about the Russian regime, its aims, its tools, is pretty similar from the south to the north, from the east to the west when it comes to the allies, and to many, many other countries, not only allies. Uh, so I think it's good that we finally share a more or less common understanding about the regime we are dealing with. Uh, obviously, Russia itself has done a lot to uh, ensure that outcome, because uh, while previously Russians used to harass the Baltic states and closer neighbors, they have now picked a much larger front, and they go attacking with different hybrid uh, tools uh, countries like the United States or Great Britain or other major powers. So I must say that the focus has moved from the Baltic states more to the general Western Russian confrontation. Uh, we are not so much on the spot anymore, 
which is characterized by the fact that in this awkward uh, poll, which frequently is uh, done in Russia, who are our biggest enemies? And usually Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were taking the sort of the first three uh, posts there. But now we have fallen seriously down. The, the list of enemies has uh, uh, some of the major countries, including the, the one we are, we are here now, uh, have taken the, the, the first, second, and third position. But obviously also Ukraine and, 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 uh, and other countries where there is uh, an active warfare going on. Uh, so that, that is how the, the general strategic picture looks like. Uh, of course, Putin uses this confrontation. I mean, he has created this confrontation, and he uses this confrontation uh, for mobilizing the population, and of course, the elections, uh, which are now very, very soon forthcoming, uh, are an important milestone here, and the speech was very much connected uh, to the election. I mean, the US experts know it better than I do, but. Uh, as far as our experts are um, saying, uh, uh, they, they, they make a point that uh, all, these, all those weapons shown by, by Russians are, are really science fiction at this point. But obviously, they indicate the directions of where Russian research is going. Uh, so we shouldn't just cast it aside and say, well, this was only uh, you know, movie making uh, and cartoons, et cetera, et cetera. We should take it seriously, but we don't believe that these are weapons uh, which will be imminently deployed uh, or, or uh, sort of usable for the, for the Russian uh, armed forces. So that's where we stand. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, I must say that Putin sort of constantly surprises me. It's, it's amazing to what length he's ready to go. And I mean, I mean, it's difficult to predict anymore what would be off the charts for him and, and what, is, what are the available tools for him, like uh, trying to kill uh, his former agent uh, with, a, with a nerve gas in the, in the middle of the UK. I mean, what, what is he doing? Uh, obviously, this only enhances this uh, extreme atmosphere of, uh, of uh, coldness between uh, Russia and the Western community. Uh, I think there is one important lesson from those actions, which is that Putin assumes that Russia, especially in military and defense matters, is in a weaker position. So his strategy is to move fast and uh, to, do act, to do operations or actions which are surprising to us. Uh, I mean, Syria is the best case in point. If you would be a Western military planner, then your classical assumption would be that you cannot take a bunch of planes and put it in the middle of the desert uh, in a situation where you don't have land forces there, where the supply routes are very long and politically extremely complicated, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of assumptions we would make in assessing Putin's, or in assessing our own actions are not uh, applicable when it comes to assessing Putin's actions. So we should be very careful, and we should never say, oh, that will never happen. I think that would be a mistake. I, I, I'm wondering uh, how US policy towards Russia looks from Tallinn. I, I, I call the, it's, it's in some ways, it's split personality. On the one hand, the military response has been very robust. The European Deterrence Initiative is a strong bipartisan signal of, of U.S. support. Um, you have the uh, Russian sanctions that uh, Congress overwhelmingly voted. Uh, but I'm just wondering, so that's been good, but how do you see uh, the Trump administration's development of policy towards Russia? How does that look from your vantage point? 
we have our ambassador here. Oh. He could I was he, hunting he, to you. <laughs> he, could, he could take that question. <laughs> now, as you said, uh, the, the US policy when it comes to the uh, alliance matters is very clear, very strong, and there is uh, a strong spirit of continuity in those moves. Uh, in fact, uh, when we take, for instance, the European Deterrence Initiative, then the sums of money which are dispersed now uh, are considerably higher than they were in the past. Uh, US is bringing back troops to Europe. Perhaps we would like it to be even quicker, but I think the, 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 there is a clear direction to where the US is moving when it comes to its posture in Europe. Uh, so I think we are in a, in a pretty sound ground here. And uh, uh, in April, in the beginning of April, there will also be what we call a mini summit. Three Baltic presidents will come to DC and there will be a meeting with uh, President Trump. Uh, and we uh, foresee kind of a, a, a forward-looking meeting, uh, and we hope uh, that a number of uh, security, defense, and other matters will be addressed. I'm going to ask you one, one last question, and then I'm going to bring our audience into the conversation. Uh, not only is March 18th the um, uh, Russian presidential election, but importantly, it's the fourth anniversary of uh, the Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. We don't talk about Donbass anymore. We don't talk about the ceasefire violations, even though there was a major U.S. policy uh, shift in providing uh, javelins and more lethal assistance to the Ukrainian government. Help us, from a defense perspective, understand where we are with this conflict in Ukraine. Well, let me start by saying that uh, U.S. engagement in, uh, in addressing this conflict, uh, trying to manage it and trying to find a diplomatic solution is, uh, I think, of utmost importance. And uh, I'm personally very happy that my good old friend, Kurt Volker, one of the very experienced diplomats uh, who also knows Russia well and knows the region well, is uh, 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 working on this uh, file. Uh, and uh, I very much agree with you that the U.S. decision to provide arms to Ukraine, while those arms probably don't make such an enormous difference in the battlefield, are a very important uh, political signal to uh, Ukrainians, uh, but obviously also to Russians. So I think that is a very important uh, uh, aspect. Uh, I very much agree with you that occasionally we tend to forget the conflict. Uh, although people are dying literally every day, I mean, not, not in big numbers, but still. Uh, and uh, we should try to keep Eastern Ukrainian uh, conflict in our focus uh, and uh, try to do the best uh, to find a diplomatic solution, because probably there, there is no other solution. Uh, as you know, there is a semi-idea on the table when it comes to peacekeeping, uh, the, the possible UN peacekeeping units. Uh, but for me, it seems a very raw idea, and uh, I have a feeling that uh, Russians don't take it seriously. They are ready to deploy peacekeepers if they are even ready to do that. They are ready to deploy peacekeepers only on the control line, uh, uh, but uh, not uh, on the uh, Russian-Ukrainian border. So essentially, this would be a totally meaningless operation, which would only confirm the Russian dominance over the region. Excellent. All right. I could monopolize all your time, but I won't. So we've got uh, some questions. Please raise your hand if you could identify yourself, please, and ask a short question, and then we'll get through more. So Max, I'll have you come forward. We'll start with Jeff, and then we'll just work our way down the aisle. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Jeff Rathke from CSIS. Uh, Minister, if I could ask uh, two questions. The first is about defense spending in NATO. Uh, Estonia certainly uh, is an example um, and a leader in uh, spending 2.15 percent, as you said, of its GDP on defense. Um, according to reports uh, coming out of Brussels, it seems that perhaps half of NATO allies will be on a, a trajectory to meet the target of 2 percent by 2024. Um, that's probably a disappointment, I think, if you ask people in Washington. But what's your, uh, what, what's your assessment of how, uh, how much weight that uh, target should hold in NATO's overall, uh, in, in the transatlantic security discussion? Um, is that the be-all and end-all of, uh, of transatlantic security, in your view? And separately, on the EU, you mentioned PESCO, and you, you were quite clear about uh, that duplication is not a concern. Um, and having been there at the creation of PESCO, uh, you should know that. There's also a concern that gets raised here about protectionism and whether PESCO will be a way of excluding U.S. Um, uh, firms from uh, competition in Europe. Do you see that as a concern, and, uh, and what kind of safeguards do you see that would prevent that? Thanks. Great. We'll take the colleague right there. Thank you. Please. Just, okay. Gerian Wiese from the German Liberal Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Um, you have mentioned Finland and Sweden, and um, sometimes it seems a bit um, well, unclear to me why exactly Finland hesitates and Sweden to join the NATO. We are all strong market economies. It's a very stable democracy, as opposed to, for example, Turkey, which is a member state of the NATO, but that's another topic. Um, well, and, and also your country shares very strong political and cultural ties with uh, Finland. So, um, and also Finland shares the very same threat from the East, um, just at its borders. So um, what is the Estonian government doing to maybe convince the Finland, or does it try to convince the Finnish government to rethink their attitude towards joining the NATO? And my second very short question is, um, just last, uh, in the last two weeks or something, Russia has renamed one of its um, Air Force uh, regiments after your country's capital, which uh, surely is a provocation. Um, what has been the reaction of your government to that? Thank you very much. And Yuri, I want you to always know you can make news here at CSIS. So uh, we have, I think, one more back there, and then we'll, we'll let you respond. Sir, my name is Llewellyn Hunt. I'm with the Center for European Policy Analysis, but in another capacity, I'm a sergeant with the Pennsylvania National Guard, so I've had the pleasure of uh, deploying to these cold jungles. Uh, my question is this. Earlier, you have uh, referred to the uh, the need for a comprehensive uh, approach in addressing the uh, Russian threat. Has there been any thought to um, joining with uh, other Baltic states in creating an economy of defense through joint structure, force structures or through joint acquisitions programs. Thank you. All right. Lots to chew on there. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, when it comes to burden sharing, I believe it's uh, extremely important. Uh, I mean, it's obvious that uh, the 2% uh, of Estonian defense spending uh, wouldn't carry you as far as 2% uh, of defense spending of, for instance, our German colleagues. Uh, but I think uh, there is both a practical meaning to it, but there is also a very strong symbolic uh, meaning to, to raising the defense budgets. And uh, as you said, I think countries are on the right directory, trajectory, perhaps not as quickly as we would like them to be. But I think it's very important that the thinking, the philosophy has changed in allied governments. And uh, they also feel that the public today is more ready to support that kind of an approach. If you look at the election campaign, then for instance, CDU in uh, Germany actually run, ran on the premise that the defense spending uh, should be raised. Uh, so there were votes for that kind of approach. Uh, so I, I, I am, I, I'm quite optimistic, although, as I said, the, the speed of uh, raising the budget is, uh, is slow, but I have no doubt that uh, every day when Putin does another trick, uh, you know, like, uh, the one uh, he, he did in, in the UK. This all adds uh, kind of frustration in the public opinion of uh, our allies, 
and their readiness to accept uh, raising the defense budget is, uh, is becoming more um, positive. Uh, when it comes to European Defense Fund, um, I mean, we, we were at the creation of the fund. Estonian diplomat actually led the negotiations of the fund. And it was very important for us to ensure that the fund wouldn't be uh, exclusive, but it would be inclusive. And it would also provide the way for uh, third countries to, to participate. Uh, um, obviously, one has to keep in mind that the defense spending of European countries will still be national. I mean, the fund is only a fraction of defense spending, and it will be directed to specific projects. It is not that suddenly, you know, uh, the fund takes over the whole defense spending uh, approach uh, when it comes uh, to Europe. Um, obviously, I mean, there's no secret that the fund is meant to support the European defense industries. So it's true that uh, countries who are outside the European Union would uh, inevitably have a somewhat different status. But I think uh, we have found a compromise in the statute of the, uh, of the uh, fund, uh, which uh, makes it inclusive rather than exclusive. And of course, uh, we would all hope that the US uh, system would be open uh, and inclusive uh, when it comes to European arms factors. Uh, and, um, even Estonia has uh, uh, small but, but uh, quite an interesting arms industry. So whenever there is interest here uh, in Washington, I mean, we are, we are, we are happy to, to provide ideas. So the openness should, should go both, both ways. Uh, when it comes to the, um, uh, to the Finnish approach, um, I mean, there were times when Estonia uh, made it almost its mission to explain to our Finnish neighbors uh, uh, how they should relate to the alliance. We have decided that it's not the best strategy. Uh, and it could actually have a, almost a counter effect. So uh, we are emphasizing that it is a sovereign decision of every nation. There are historic reasons why the Finnish population has an attitude which it has. Uh, so the best we can do at the moment is to enhance cooperation uh, between Finland and allies, and between Finland uh, and uh, NATO. Uh, it is also an interesting issue, and uh, when I was working at ICDS, at the Institute in Tallinn, which you mentioned, uh, we wrote a study which was named uh, Closing the Baltic Gap, which spoke about the deterrence challenges uh, when it comes to the Baltic states. And we uh, emphasized that while EU is not a collective defense organization, it would provide certain legal framework for countries like Finland and Sweden to be involved in operations of crisis management, also in Europe, in protecting Europe, because there is an article, uh, I don't know, are there gourmands of EU, uh, EU legislation here in the room, there's an article 42.7, which is basically very similar to the collective defense article uh, of, the, uh, of, of the alliance. And I'm, I'm not saying that this can be used uh, in terms of uh, kind of operating separately. But if there is a need for a legal framework for Finland and Sweden to kind of latch on to their allied operation, then they can always do it through this paragraph 42.7 in the Lisbon Treaty. So it's kind of an added legal way or legal framework f 
for Finns and Swedes to, to come on board. Um, when it comes to the Air Force Regiment, uh, then you're right. Um, it was uh, named the, the Tallinn Regiment. Uh, but in all honesty, there are already two units uh, which have come from Estonia when the Russian troops left Estonia, which are called the Tallinn. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a land division, uh, and then there is the Air Force Regiment you, you mentioned. Uh, it's actually, unfortunately, quite an old thing, but uh, the focus sort of re-emerged when the regiment was reorganized. But obviously, this is something which is pure symbolics. We didn't find a reason to, to pick a fight over, over that. I mean, they can name their regiments. They want to name all regiments in, in whatever way they, they decide. No, we, we, we cannot do anything about it. Uh, and the last question was about... Uh, Baltic jointness. Uh, Baltic jointness. We, we We... Work as closely as uh, as possible with our our Baltic neighbors, uh, and uh, there are a lot of joint projects. For instance, the Baltic Defense College is probably one of the most successful uh, joint projects we have. There are a lot of exercises where we participate together. Uh, when it comes to procurement, uh, we have a special body, kind of uh, a group of officials from all three defense ministries which sort of constantly discusses the plans and policies of, uh, of different uh, countries when it comes to purchases. But since we don't have joint units as such, and our defense forces, the development of our defense forces is on a very different stage, and different uh, Baltic states also have a somewhat different uh, defense concept. You know that Latvia, for instance, has a professional force, a fairly small one. Estonia and now Lithuania uh, uh, will have the um, conscript-based force of the reserve army force. So I don't think it's very easy to find uh, common objects of procurement, but uh, that would certainly be our preference. Um, Nowadays, our joint procurements are actually, uh, when speaking about Estonia, our joint procurements are uh, with Finland. We, we are just now uh, in the process of procuring uh, um, self-propelled howitzer. It's called K9. It's a South Korean, very, very serious piece of artillery, uh, mo mobile artillery. So we do it together with Finns. Great. Well, Minister Luik, an hour spent with you is an hour very well spent. Uh, you've given us some tremendous insights, and perhaps more importantly, you've given us confidence uh, about the, the health of NATO and the transatlantic relationship. Much work to be done, but uh, as you said, we're, in, we're on the right trajectory. Uh, thank you so much for thank what you. you do, and please join me for thanking Minister Luik. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was fantastic.